Hello, everyone, and welcome to Skeptical Inquirer Presents. This is a series of live online presentations from leading experts in science, skepticism, medicine, media, activism, and advocacy, all devoted to the cause of advancing science over pseudoscience, media literacy over conspiracy theories, and critical thinking over magical thinking. My name is Kenny Coogan, and I have been with the Center for Inquiry since 2016. I work in the education sector, which now includes TIES, the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science, Generation Skeptics, and Science Saves. The Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science provides teachers the tools they need to effectively teach evolution and answer its critics based on the Next Generation Science Standards or NGSS. The Generation Skeptics Program is brand new as of two weeks ago and aims to develop and foster an understanding of the world through inquiry-based learning. We provide material to, com to complement and enhance existing science and educational programs. And Science Saves is created by teachers for teachers, just like our other programs, with lessons in every discipline. K through 12, promoting the fact that thanks to science, individuals' lives are longer, healthier, easier, and fuller. And all of those programs, I believe, directly relate to our guest presenter this evening. Carl Weinman is a professor of physics and education at Stanford University. He has been widely recognized for his experimental research in both physics with a Nobel Prize in 2001 and University Science and Engineering Education. He founded FET, which we were just talking about and I utilized when I was a middle school teacher, which provides interactive simulations that are used nearly a million times a day to learn science. And he has published a book, Improving How Universities Teach Science. He is studying problem solving expertise in science and engineering and how this can be better measured and taught. If you have questions for him, please type them into the Q&A function at the bottom, if you're attending this live, and I will ask him the best questions at the end of this presentation. And thank you so much, Carl, for joining us tonight. Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me start by sharing my screen. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk about science education, uh, what we get wrong and how to do it better. <clears throat> and I wanna start by pointing out that the educational goal I'm really after here is not to make all students into scientists, but that we need to have all students have some basic scientific literacy. So they can understand what science is and how it can help them make decisions in many different aspects of their life, work, health, etc. And the focus of this talk is really about on college education. And that's because we sort of have the best research on what's wrong and how to do it better there. But the results are applied quite broadly. So what I'm going to cover today is I'll start with just a, a general introduction of some basic ideas about how the brain learns complex thinking and some of the deficiencies in the traditional teaching approaches, and then move on to how to do it better, showing you some examples of research on novel ways to teach in university classrooms and the kind of results we can get. And then I'll go to kind of a, a general overview of research findings uh, on the teaching of of science and really expertise in that teaching, what works to improve learning and why. And then I'll just finish up with a few remarks about what institutions can and should do to improve science education. Now, before I get into those details though, I just wanna give you a little bit of background on how I got involved in this education business and my basic uh, perspective on on the subject that I've pursued. And I didn't get interested in educa science education because of teaching in classes. Actually, I got interested in it because of my atomic physics research. And I saw this puzzle, which was these 
graduate students would come in to work in my research lab after many years of great success in their math and physics classes. But in spite of that, they really didn't seem to know how to do physics when they came to work for me. But it was clear there wasn't anything fundamentally wrong, defective about them, because after just a few years working in the lab, they had consistently turned into expert physicists. And so after I saw this pattern over and over again with enough students, I decided there was just a fundamental question here, and I treat it like a science question. And so I started looking into what was the research on how people learn, particularly how they learn physics. And we have a lot more research now, but there was enough then for this to make, after a few years of reading articles, for this to make sense and explain why this happened and why it wasn't an, a puzzle. And this also made me realize there were much more effective ways to teach than what was being done in most of our classes. But it also got me doing interested and started doing science education research, doing experiments, collecting data in classes, and finding basic principles to, to explain that. But my perspective sort of focus has always been in this, continues to be sort of expertise. What is thinking like a good scientist or engineer, and how is that best taught and learned? Now, it turns out that over the past couple of decades, there's been actually major advances in giving us new insights on how to learn and teach this kind of complex thinking, thinking like a scientist. And it comes from three different areas of research that give nice complementary results. There's the cognitive psychologists who study basic processes of teaching and thinking and learning and mostly in laboratory settings. There's brain research. And then there's the kind of research that mostly that I do, which is university faculty and science departments, physicists, biologists, chemists, et cetera, uh, doing research, doing studies in their classrooms on teaching and learning and measuring the results. And I want to just say that most of the data comes from universities, but I, we know enough about this subject to be quite confident that it certainly applies to high school and to some extent even lower grades than that. But before I get into too much into the details, I, I do want to make the point that Oftentimes when I talk about this, people always will say, well, why are you worrying about colleges and universities that really the problems in, in the K-12 system and you need to change science education there? And while I'll agree that it, there's lots more students there and it would be good if we made improvements there, I think what we clearly have data <clears throat> showing that universities and colleges can do a much better job in their education of students. And we really need that for the future K-12 science teachers to improve them. So what have we learned? Well, at the most basic level, it's just rethinking how this learning happens. And the old and still really currently pervasive model of of learning is really that these students come into our classrooms and the student brains vary in different ways. And we immerse them in knowledge in the teaching. And then that knowledge soaks into different amounts depending on the, the state of those brains. Now, with this is one's perspective on learning, then the focus, and this is what almost all colleges and universities do focus on is, how they can select the best brains that the knowledge is going to soak in best, and then what to put in the knowledge soup, the curriculum, and what they teach that is going to fill up those brains in the best, in the most efficient, efficient way. Now, this is a very widely held model and has been that way for a long time, but nevertheless, it's just plain wrong. And 
the research gives us quite a different perspective on learning. What it says is that these student brains are not as, as particularly at the university level are not really very different at the beginning, but that their education transforms them through the educational process. The brains are changed. Their the neurons are rewired in the process of the intense thinking that goes on in the educational process. And it's really these changed rewired brains have improved capabilities. And so really the, the fundamental process here should be thought of as not selecting the best brains and feeding them, but rather developing the brains of all the students. Now, this view we can even see now happening in, in brain imaging. And I just to give you an example here, uh, here's the brains of two people who are in an MRI machines and interpreting a medical x-ray. And on the right is the brain of a medical student who's just learning how to do this. And on the left is the brain of an expert radiologist who spent many years for you know becoming very good at this and you can see how their brains are activated in very different ways just as a result of their of their education they've had so the research tells us really that learning this meaningful learning is is about enhancing the relevant neuron connections and so to this extent it's really very much like muscle development in the way that if you want to build up a muscle, it's what matters is you have to exercise it intensely and you've got to do the right kind of exercise to stress the muscle you want to build up. And so the same is true in the brain. You've got to have it practicing the kind of the thinking that you want to learn and it's got to be done intensively and over a long period of time. Now, re you can sort of think about researchers in education and learning are really most of what they're devoting their time to is finding more effective ways to teach by having, by finding better ways to exercise the brains. And so you can, are more effective at developing new skills in it. And, and so this is, from this research, we're both learning more ways to have every brain learn better, but also it shows that far more students are capable of, of learning and learning science than if you teach them in the right way. And at a fairly basic level, the, the key is really the practicing the thinking you want them to learn with good feedback to help guide that thinking. And so this right away tells you there's a real problem with how we teach science, which is overwhelmingly, although we are making some progress in changing this because of the research, but it's still overwhelmingly taught by lectures with a professor standing up and talking and the students sitting, listening to them, maybe taking notes. And this is this process is profoundly not exercising the brain. And so it's really not accomplishing the development of brain that you we know is important for good education. And at best, this kind of teaching can the, have the students sort of learn to follow procedures for specific uh, situations or problems, but they really are very poor at learning to solve novel problems and and tackle things in new ways. And this is when I talked about my the failings of the students coming in to work in my lab. This is that was just an example of this. So let me move on to how we can do better and showing you how we have done better because some research on novel ways to teach and what kind of results we can get. So this is a one experiment that was done I had some involvement in, and it was taking a very large introductory physics class. And it was so large, we could find two sections of it that had 270 students each, that the student populations were, were very similar. And 
then these two sections were taught in two different ways. The, the one, the control section was taught by a highly experienced professor who had good student ratings, but taught a fairly standard lecture approach. And then the experimental section was taught by someone who was a fairly new PhD, but trained in these principles and methods of research-based teaching in the program I was running. And the two instructors then agreed to cover the same amount, the same material in the same amount of class time. And then they gave both sections the same exam to test how much learning they'd gotten from these classes. <clears throat> So I assume you know what the basic lecture class was like. Mm -hmm. Like I say, the faculty are talking, students are listening. The experimental class, the way it worked was the students had a short pre-class reading assignment, which just taught them some basic facts and terminology without having to waste class time on telling them that. And then in class, they would be answered spend their time answering questions and solving problems. And so, for example, here's an example of one question they were given of, you have this circuit with a battery and light bulbs here. And then, and then the students were asked, what's gonna happen to the brightness of bulb two when that switch is closed? And they got a set of, of choices here huh, to, to select from. Now, because this was a big class, you want to sort of make sure all students are involved. So we use some technology. So every student had to answer this with a what device we call the clicker, which just electronically transmitted their, their answer. Nowadays, that's mostly been replaced by cell phones. But the point is the student decides when answer they think is right and they push the button and then the instructor's computer records who they were and what answer they chose. Now, after they voted, they're not told what the answer is. Instead, they're told to discuss with their neighbors. So in a big lecture class, a big lecture theater like this, it'd be the students on either side with them, discuss what answer was right and why, and then they would have to re-vote. And while they're having those discussions, the instructor's not just sitting waiting for them to finish, they're circulating around up and down the aisles, listening in on those conversations to get little snapshots of what's going on in those students' brains, what aspects of their thinking is like you, what you hope and what's, what's wrong. And so then after the second vote, you actually demonstrate to show the result. And then there's a follow-up summary by the instructor, which is not just lecturing on new material, it's giving the students feedback on which of their mental models and reasoning was correct, and even more important, which were incorrect and why. And I emphasize that's more important because one of the things I've learned from cognitive psychologists is when people are really learning is when they are thinking of something in the wrong way and they come to understand that that is wrong and, and why it's wrong and how to change it. And that's when real learning takes place. Now, this all wasn't all done with just multiple choice questions like this. For more mathematical topics, students would write, have to fill out worksheets where they would write solutions down, but it done in the same, same style of students thinking individually and then discussing with their fellow students how to do it. So if you think about what's happening in the students' brains during this, this class, they're spending their time repeatedly practicing thinking like physicists. They're having to, to decide on a, a mental model for how electricity works and then apply it into this situation and to predict what's going to happen. And they're, and they're regularly then have to test their conceptual model of electricity. And they're having to critique their reasoning and that of their fellow students. So this is very much thinking scientifically but, and practicing that thinking. But while they're doing that, they're also getting multiple forms of feedback to improve that thinking. They're getting it from 
from other students. They're getting it from com they're comparing what they predicted with what happened in the demonstration. And they're getting it from the feedback from the well-informed instructor who's informed from their conversations and seeing how they voted in the in their selections. So, but remember, I'm describing how this class worked, but this was part of an experiment. And so the comparison was how well these two different sections did on this quiz that was given in both sections. And so here's the results of that of that quiz with the histogram of the, the number of students versus their score on this test. And you can see the experiment, the histogram the, from the experimental class is much higher than the much scored much better than in the standard lecture class. Now, on this particular test, just random guessing would give it a student on average three. And so this just makes the point even clearer that how the learning from the standard lecture is just tiny. And this, we've got data from many other cases showing the same thing. But in addition to that, I want to want to emphasize how the the blue distribution and the entire distribution of the class has moved up and so that shows that this way of teaching isn't just the best most effective for say the weakest students or the strongest students it's really the most effective for the all the students all the ones that have human have brains learn better this way now that that's a result from physics. Uh, this is a result from a different discipline. This is computer science. And this is measuring a different thing here. Rather than measuring the learning of specific topics, it's looking at the drop and failure rates across the entire uh, semester students are taught. And the comparison here is not two different instructors teaching the class in different ways. It's the same set of instructors, these the four instructors teaching these four core computer science, introductory computer science courses, but these instructors change their teaching from one year to the next. So the dark, the dark blue is when they were teaching using standard lecture uh, classes and uh, approaches. And then the light green is all four of them then changed to what I label here as scientific teaching, but that's, they use very much like I would just described in the physics class where the, the class time was taken up with students posing, the instructor posing questions to the students that they would have to discuss with each other and answer. And the result is, is shown how across the board. So you have the same four instructors, but they simply adopted this more effective teaching methods and they have much lower failure rates now. It's about a third the total. And these students, they've looked at these students who were now more successful and those students are going on to be successful in their later computer science courses as well. Now, those are examples from introductory courses, I just want to point out that this same teaching methods also we've shown work much more effectively in more advanced courses. And this is something my own group has done a lot of the work on. Uh, and these are like advanced physics classes. So they're much smaller, but the much more mathematical, but the students are working together uh, completely working in small groups, completing worksheets while the instructor is circulating around monitoring how they do. And this has also shown much better learning. And just I'll just mention that now the Stanford undergraduate physics program, almost all the courses have been transformed. So they're now taught this way. Something over oh, there we go. So that there's just a general structure in these courses that we've seen works for pretty much every subject and every level uh, and it, of how the class is actually run. And so I just laid this out here that the, the students do some sort of basic preparation uh, 
for the class. It's not extensive. It, like I say, it's basically in basic information. And then the instructor will introduce the topic for the day. And then the students will work together, completing the work on these activities. Like I say, typically a worksheet where they have to write out solutions to problems and justify justifications for decisions while the instructor is circulating around monitoring how they're doing, answering individual questions. And then at a, at a reasonable stopping point, typically every 10 or 15 minutes, the instructor will then bring the class together and go over how the problems were sort of bringing the, the, all the class up to the same level, answering questions, and then, and then the students go back to working through the, the next part of the activity and that this cycle just continues through the whole class. And the, the two essential features here that are that the students are, are spending their class time thinking, they're having to practice the expert reasoning you want them to learn. And the instructor is much more knowledgeable about that thinking. And so they can provide them much more effective uh, feedback and guidance. So those are just a few examples. There's, I went back and reviewed and came up at some point with, there's something close to a thousand research studies I think you can find on looking at teaching of undergraduate uh, science and engineering that are comparing the traditional lecture approach with this, these so-called active learning or research-based teaching. And the research-based teaching consistently shows greater learning of the examples like I chose, and also lower failure and dropout rates. So it's, it's basically clearly superior. Now, I want to just make one little added note here of a problem that I've been worrying about a lot lately. And that is, if you look at this distribution that I showed you from this this class, even the students in the well-taught class, there's still a lot of them down here who aren't doing that well. They're doing much better than they could in a traditional lecture course, but they aren't that successful. And that, you know, my goal is to make, we want to compress this distribution and move all the students up to the top. And so my group has done a lot of, and we've seen this this kind of distribution in many universities. And so my group has been studying what matters and how can we change it here? And so we've collected lots of data and did lots of fancy statistical analysis of it. And we discovered that a lot of things people thought mattered didn't. Uh, but what did really matter is that the their incoming preparation. So this is their their physics preparation before they ever got to the university, that was a very strong predictor and very strong determinant of how well they were gonna do in the courses. And we found this was true at multiple universities. And so what this tells us is that the faculty are implicitly kind of confusing talent with privilege. And so they're teaching in such a way that their the coverage and pace is really optimized for sort of a top third of the class on the assumption those are the most talented and the others really just aren't good enough to matter. Whereas what we're realizing, this data is showing us that in fact, this the top third are just the most educationally privileged and that by catering essentially optimizing for them, the, the other students are being left are being left behind and doing badly. And so this is the college teaching is really just amplifying the inequities that are in our K-12 uh, science teaching system. And so the problem here is really not with the students, it's really the, the nature of the teaching. And that if we could match the curriculum better to the actual students in the background they have, many more would be successful. Now, this was our our conclusion from looking at the data. And we so we've been working on trying to do a better job of that. And we have some, so 
teaching these courses differently. And we have some preliminary indications that that seems to be successful. Okay, let me move on <clears throat> here to research findings that sort of define teaching expertise. And so this is my attempt to kind of summarize everything the research on science education has told us. And so in each of these boxes kind of represents major areas of research, but the, the key thing that has to happen and is in the box in the center that the students have to be practicing solving problems, making decisions here. And they have, while they're doing that practice, they have to have good feedback. And we know that that means feedback that's timely, specific, and actionable about what they can do to do better. But there's a bunch of things that have to go into the design of these practice problems. There's the the disciplinary expertise, the the knowledge that and application of it that you you specifically want them to learn and for a subject. Then there's the the idea that it really needs to be matched to and build on the student's prior knowledge and experience so that it's challenging the problems are challenging but doable with effort then there's motivation is really critical that students can believe they can learn and they want to learn and put in the the strenuous mental effort that we know is is important for good learning and then there's some basic constraints about how the brain works they're important and then down here, there's the research on how to actually implement these things in the actual classroom and then the, the particular nature of the tasks and the deliverables that students have to produce in class. And then the, the social learning benefits. That's the idea that working, working in small groups in the optimum way, we have good data that students learn better than if they're left to do it individually. And so just had a, there's another area of, of optimizing learning through that process. Now, I don't have time to go through in detail in all of these. I just, I do want to make the point that this body of research really defines teaching expertise in a way I don't think you could do 20 years ago. And it really gives you a set of practices that research shows produce more learning. So I'm just going to say a little about a couple of these boxes where, it, because these are areas where current teaching is, is sort of the most ignorant of the results, and I would say defective in its, in its approaches. And so the, the disciplinary expertise, the idea you want to have be able, students be able to solve problems like a scientist, or at least in an introductory class, more like a scientist does. And so my own group has done lots of work in the recent years studying the process of scientific problem solving. And we've seen that it's really defined by making a set of decisions with limited information where you don't know everything you need to know. So you just have to make an informed, educated guess using the appropriate scientific knowledge. And what we see is across all the fields of science and actually engineering as well, there's the same set of 29 decisions made during the problem solving process. And these are things like deciding what concepts and models are relevant to the problem, what information's relevant, what's needed, what's irrelevant, deciding what approximations or simplifications are appropriate, deciding how to find the information that you need to solve the problem, et cetera, for a bunch more down to when you get a solution, deciding how to test that solution conclusion if it, if it makes sense and if it's right. Now, if you just look at these particular uh, decisions that I list here, and then you look at the typical science class and you look at the nature of the homework and exam problems given in those classes, you see that they've really actively re explicitly removed most of these decisions from the process. They, you know, the 
concepts and models to use. Well, that's just whatever the topic was for the week that that the problems given in the the problems always give exactly the information needed and only the information needed to solve the problem. They're told what approximations are appropriate and and so on. They're given the, the information and they're never had to justify how things are right. And so the the in the class, these decisions are really removed from the problems. And so the students never get an opportunity to practice this thinking. And so they don't learn it. And so they they end up learning knowledge, but really never how to usefully apply it to solve meaningful problems. And again, this is goes back to my comment about the my students coming into my lab doing well in courses and not being able to do physics. And this this is exactly why not. And so this is this is just an example of a deficiency in the way to fix it, obviously, is just to stop removing these and make thing, these, these decisions part of solving the real problems. Now, I want to say something else about brain constraints, because this is a there's a very fundamental process, very well known to cognitive psychologists, which is which is completely ignored in in teaching, and it's really quite critical. And it has to do with how the the brain processes and and remembers information. And the memory understand memory. It really has two components. There's the the second component is the long term memory, and this is what most of us think about when we hear the term memory, and it's got a very large capacity and a long duration. But then in addition, there's this short, so-called short-term working memory. And this is like a buffer that information has to go through before it can be processed and get into long-term memory. And this, this working memory, it has a short time scale, sort of minutes, but most importantly, it's got a very tiny capacity, the typical human brain can keep track of about six new items at once. And this is really the, the amount of things the brain can pay attention to at the same time. But because of this very limited capacity, it means that when you get some new piece of information comes in, it pushes something out of the working memory. And so that what gets pushed out never gets processed and into long-term memory. Now, this has really severe implications for teaching because it means that any additional items reduce processing and learning. And so you really have to think very carefully about how much demands you're putting on working memory. And the typical lecture just puts overwhelming demands on working memory because all the jar use of jargon, complex figures that illustrate many things, and just the number of topics and information covered in a typical lecture are vastly more than six. And so it just overwhelms the learner's working memory. And so they can do very little processing and learning of, of the information. And it's, it's much worse if the student's attention are split like they often are in listening to boring lectures. So they're checking their cell phones, et cetera, because then they're using the working memory for something else entirely. Okay, so that's just a quick summary here of what, what really defines teaching expertise. And I just want to make the point here is that we researchers know a lot about what kind of practices achieve better learning and you know, how to do this. But this isn't widely known and used by college teachers. And so this is really what we're doing wrong. And, and so I'll kind of end up here with a few comments about what institutions can and should do to improve this. So the first thing is they just need to recognize this most fundamental aspect that, that education should be about thinking how to develop the heat student brains, not just filling them and how to really maximize the, the potential 
for all students, which is much greater than is being achieved now. And then the next thing is just recognizing that there is such a thing as teaching expertise, that the teaching methods really matter. And I, I'd argue that, that in the almost every university, this is really not something that's generally understood and, and accepted. But once you recognize that the teaching methods really matter in student outcomes, then they should start measuring what teaching methods are actually being used in their classes. So, you know, which faculty are doing the pedagogical equivalent of bloodletting and which are using the equivalent to antibiotics. And then they need to evaluate the teaching and reward and hire and promote faculty on the basis of the use of these best research-based instructional practices. And if they did this, that would lead to a profound improvement in the learning of science throughout our university system and ultimately, I'd argue, the K-12 as well. Now, I'll just make the final plug here that large-scale improvement really is possible. This isn't a completely crazy idea. And I can refer to my book uh, because for that, because this book was really the discuss these large scale experiments that I did, where we showed how you really could change the teaching of hundreds of science teachers and most of the, the credit hours at two major universities with no, no increase in teaching costs, but adopting a much better practices. So, some of you may be thinking, and I, because I get this question a lot, is the idea that, well, traditional lectures can't be as bad as I claim, because look at all the university professors who were taught by traditional lectures and how well they turned out. And from the point of view of skeptical inquiry, this is a, this is a, an important question to, to tackle, because I'll point out that this was exactly the same justification that we used to make uh, bloodletting the medical treatment of choice for about 2,000 years. And it was only when science, science came along and realized you need to do proper comparison groups in, your, in what treatments were more effective that you could really tell the, tell the difference. And that's what we're now doing in education. And so... If you had a good comparison group, you'd see that those professors could have learned more and many more student of their classmates could have done better. So I'll just stop with this so there's time for questions. Just the conclusion is that research shows that what good design and implementation is that and how it achieves much better learning than the traditional way we're teaching now and why and that it's really about the brain needing to practice what you want to learn and develop new capabilities. And here's some of uh, my favorite references if you want to learn more about this, some books here at the top and some other website and articles to look at. So thank you. And so now I'll take questions. Thank you so much, Carl, everybody was very interested because we have a lot of questions and a lot of positive feedback. And uh, Pitta, Pete, and Charles all kind of have a similar theme. They're concerned about time. Um, so Kitta says, you know, I have a 50 minute class. Other people, P was talking about, you know, how do you fit all of this in into a semester? Yeah. Or are you using this method for all of the topics? So yeah. do you want to talk a little bit about time management? Yeah. yeah, that's a that's a very important question. And we, in this big experiment of changing all these courses, we looked at that pretty carefully. And you need, you know, the, the answer is that if done right, you can cover just about as much material, uh, maybe, a, maybe a little less, sometimes 10% or so. But you really do have to think carefully about how to optimize your use of time and use of both student time and classroom time to, to cover as much material as you can. And one, one thing that's important here is that 
you don't have to cover everything in class because you're giving the students the capabilities in class to, to learn and master some things outside of class, maybe in homework without it spending class time on it. And that, that can really be beneficial. So uh, like I say, generally speaking, it, it, if, if you give it careful thought about how you're using your time, you can cover pretty much the same material. Now you mentioned that there was like thousands of articles based on this type well, of hundreds and anyway, hundreds. Yeah. Okay, sorry, hundreds. Ralph is concerned. How do you minimize bias in your research when you're comparing lecturing versus your new methods? It seems like you're stacking the deck. Students drilled on facts would likely do better when tested on facts. Students drilled on story problems would likely to do better with when tested on story problems. Uh, yeah, so I mean, that's a that's a reasonable concern. Um, and in fact, if you do look at sort of traditional test problems, uh, it students don't usually change that much in how they do. And so one there's quite a bit of, of effort that goes into designing essentially a th more authentic test questions that you're going to test these students on where you're trying to really do a, a, a better job of capturing the scientific reasoning process and and problems that test the that that reasoning process and so there there is a lot of of design and checking that goes into the measures that you use actually on on these kinds of tests. And, Andrew, you know, and just in that one example I showed you from the physics course, I mean, there the two instructors had carefully agreed ahead of time on what their learning goals were going to be, and then the test was designed by jointly prepared to match those learning goals. So that that gives you a an unbiased measure. Andrew and Josephine also have similar questions to each other. They were wondering if this is applicable to non-science subjects. They're thinking um, like theoretically or psychology or concepts. Yeah, so different people will give you different beliefs on this. My belief is that this is quite uh, applicable to pretty much every subject. Uh, in terms of research, the research has overwhelmingly been done in science and engineering courses. There's some done in the social sciences. It, it seems to be pretty consistent with this. And I think if you look at the kind of learning and problem challenges you've got in those courses, you be, would be quite confident it's similar. When you get into the humanities, it starts you start having to rely more on the idea that the cognitive scientists, psychologists tell you that really, you know, what's important is the kind of thinking that you're doing. And so then I'm I'm taking a, a somewhat bigger leap with the data, but I'm pretty confident that if you, even in humanities classes, if you kind of think what the kinds of decisions that you know, a, an expert in humanities is making and in, 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 you know, critical reading or writing, and you have the students really practicing that kind of thinking with feedback, you'll still, you'll get the same, also the same kind of improved results. William was wondering if you have any conclusions for what active learning tasks should and should not be structured. Uh, is there like different categories of subjects that are better, like top-down lecture versus what you were mentioning? So I think it's very hard to find any where top-down lecture is is better. Uh, I think in these active learning, we find that things that involve just a lot of kind of procedural work, calculations, you know, mathematical derivations are not particularly effective uh, and useful. And, and so to some extent, the, those can be best done by students just individually practicing them because they're sort of a, 
in some sense a routine kind of thing and that active learning is best devoted to things where the students really have to practice are really practicing kind of critical thinking decision making justification of, of methods etc do you have any experience with introverted students or maybe shy students ellen wants to know yeah so you know that's a that's a trickle uh, a, can be a complicated issue of dealing with with the range of student personality types uh, and we we work pretty hard on you 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 first you when you're structuring the groups and how the groups are working it is important to to recognize people are different and making sure that there's some opportunities for thinking individually, whereas, you know, extroverts like to start talking right away. <laughs> and it's better to give all students a chance to do some thinking first before they have to start talking with each other. And you sort of have norms of behavior that encourage everybody to, to talk and, and, and don't, so the, the groups don't get dominated by personality types. And that's always, is, so those things take care of most of those problems. You occasionally have students who just really don't want to work in groups. And I, I'm very intolerant of that because I look at students, they're going off in life and they're going to have to work with other people. And if they, you know, they need to learn to do that, whether they know it or not. And so I sort of am pretty heavy handed on ones who just say they they refuse to just because I know it's kind of essential for them. All right, I'll give you a comment. Brian says, excellent content. It makes obvious sense. I was going for a major in physics, but was completely blown away by the lectures. I think research based teaching would have made a huge difference for me. All right, uh, Jean Luc says, thank you for the great lecture. If the brain limits processing to five to seven chunks, how do you ensure and transfer to long-term memory before introducing new items? Let's say if you're doing a 50-minute class or a two-hour class. Yeah. So uh yeah, so that's a that's a good question. And basically what you need to do is have this that stuff that's in the working memory. You need a, a it needs to be processed essentially. And so you've got to have things where you're, you've got a limited amount of new information and then you're doing some tasks to, to process, think about, use that, and then it goes into long-term memory and then you can move on to, to more, to other new stuff beyond that. So it's a, it's a way of kind of recognizing the need to to structure how you have things happen. And it, you know, a long class, no matter how you teach it, can be pretty demanding on people's brains. You know, they get worn out. And then speaking of structure, some people want some specifics. William would like to know for the group work, do the students know each other or do you assign the groups? Yeah. So there's a lot of research and fairly unclear <laughs> results on how to handle the formation of groups. Uh, what I will say is pretty clear is the group size should be three to four and the groups should be together enough. They, they don't need to start together, but they should, you shouldn't keep changing them around because people are just more, much more comfortable working together with people they they've gotten to know and so you you don't want to move them around very much the there's a lot of disagreement on whether you are better off having sort of mixed I'll say mixed background you know prep, mixed preparation groups or similar preparation groups uh and they're claims on both sides uh, is all I can say on that. And I think probably it ultimately it doesn't really matter too much. What does, we do know some things matter. It matters a lot if you have, uh, if you have a, a single 
well, in, in science classes where they're sort of male majority, if you have a single female or you have a single underrepresented minority in a group, they don't do as well if they, unless you have sort of more than more than one of them. Mike says, I teach eight, eight to 12th grade and use a use project-based learning approach to try to implement many of the ideas you're sharing. Um, a lot of times when they get in their first year of college, they have trouble because it's drill and kill and my students can feel unprepared for this. Is it possible to do both thinking like a scientist, like a hybrid, thinking like a scientist and traditional lecture so they're really ready for their freshman year of college? So I, I'm not sure about for high school. What I'm pretty sure is in college, you can have the students learn uh, how to learn. Uh, I mean, they do that better in this active learning because you're you're making the learning much more explicit and structured. And so they can learn how to learn in the in the active learning classes well enough to be successful in their in their subsequent classes where they they sort of are taking a much more active role in the lecture and thinking about the lecture. Uh, so that's just something we've seen from the college experience, how to prepare them, the high school, how to prepare them for that transition to college. I'm not so sure about and how well it would work in the same way. All right, because of time, we'll do two more questions and both of them are kind of like the implementation of your ideas. Um, Ellen asks, what about students who argue that it's the teacher's job to teach? And this may be more middle school and high school, but probably at the college level as well. Yeah, you, you know, you, you get this at the college level too. And one of the things we found out so in this project of this large scale change project is that it's really important to explain to the students why you're teaching this way and how it's how it's for their benefit, giving them essentially sort of a short version of my of this talk. And we we find that's quite important. So they don't think they're guinea pigs in your your experiment. Uh, and you know, there's still some that won't oh completely convince everybody immediately, but it we find it does a pretty good job. And over time they get much more used to it and happy with the teaching this way. All right, that answer kind of bleeds into the last question, but I'll ask it still. Mark would like to know, do you have any research or info on how to change certain cultural ideas regarding the importance of STEM learning to those people who have been raised in a culture that does not value STEM? And then there are some other questions about like college admin, supporting, not supporting this type of learning. So could you maybe just talk about other than giving a little brief uh, yeah, so presentation of what you just did, how can you change like admin or the, the your the, peers idea? Yeah. So the the first part of the question, I the you know, how do you get people to value STEM who don't? And I can't really give an answer to that. I don't never explored that really. In terms of, you know, in terms of changing university administrators and their thinking i mean it's a it's a slow process you try and show them data and it, you know and some of them get convinced by data uh and some don't and uh but there's sort of a a growing national awareness i would say and you know na some national academy studies some some OSTP reports and things that, that are sort of making this, emphasizing this and, you know, so one can can use those kinds of things. We have the AAU, which is the American Association of Universities, which are sort of the 70 or so most prominent universities. They have a program now and their STEM initiative really to making universities more aware of good teaching and how to do it and encouraging that. All right. Well, thank you for everyone who attended the uh, webinar live. And thank you, Carl Wyman. You're a professor of physics and education at Stanford University.
other than Stanford University, is there a website or a place you would like to direct people who are more inter interested in this to find more research? Um, let me just go back to my, you know, I mean, it, here, here are different things that the CWSEI website is a, probably a place that has a lot of just short, it has a bunch of research articles that came out of this, but also a bunch of short little two-page guides on implementing particular practices that might be useful for people, so. All right, thank you so much, Carl, and everybody else. We hope you join our next month's webinar. And uh, thank you once again.